Chapter Ten of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As soon as the immediate game we were watching was finished, the players rose and greeted Lucio with a good deal of eagerness and effusion. I instinctively guessed from their manner that they looked upon him as an influential member of the club, a person likely to lend them money to gamble with and otherwise to oblige them in various ways financially speaking he introduced me to them all and i was not slow to perceive the effect my name had upon most of them i was asked if i would join in a game of baccarat and i readily consented the stakes were ruinously high but i had no need to falter for that one of the players near me was a fair-haired young man handsome in face and of aristocratic bearing he had been introduced to me as Viscount Linton. I noticed him particularly on account of the reckless way he had of doubling his stakes suddenly, and apparently out of mere bravado, and when he lost, as he mostly did, he laughed uproariously as though he were drunk or delirious. On first beginning to play, I was entirely indifferent as to the results of the game, caring nothing at all as to whether I had losses or gains. Lucio did not join us, but sat apart, quietly observant, and watching me, so I fancied, more than any one. And, as chance would have it, all the luck came my way, and I won steadily. The more I won, the more excited I became, till presently my humor changed, and I was seized by a whimsical desire to lose. I suppose it was the touch of some better impulse in my nature that made me wish for this young Linton's sake for he seemed literally maddened by my constant winnings, and continued his foolhardy and desperate play. His young face grew drawn and sharply thin, and his eyes glittered with a hungry feverishness. The other gamesters, though sharing in his run of ill luck, seemed better able to stand it, or perhaps they concealed their feelings more cleverly. Anyhow, I know I caught myself very earnestly wishing that this devil's luck of mine would desert me, and set in that young Viscount's direction but my wishes were no use. Again and again I gathered up the stakes, till at last the players rose, Viscount Linton among them. "'Well, I'm cleaned out,' he said with a loud forced laugh. "'You must give me my chance of a revanche to-morrow, Mr. Tempest.' I bowed. "'With pleasure.' He called a waiter at the end of the room to bring him a brandy and soda, and meanwhile I was surrounded by the rest of the men, all of them repeating the Viscount's suggestion of a revanche and strenuously urging upon me the necessity of returning to the club the next night in order to give them an opportunity of winning back what they had lost. I readily agreed, and while we were in the midst of talk, Lucio suddenly addressed young Linton. "'Will you make up another game with me?' he inquired. "'I'll start the bank with this.' And he placed two crisp notes of five hundred pounds each on the table. There was a moment's silence. The Viscount was thirstily drinking his brandy and soda, and glanced over the rim of his tall tumbler at the notes with covetous bloodshot eyes. Then he shrugged his shoulders indifferently. "'I can't stake anything,' he said. "'I've already told you. I'm cleaned out. Stony broke, as the slang goes. It's no use my joining.' "'Sit down, sit down, Linton,' urged one man near him. "'I'll lend you enough to go on with.' "'Thanks, I'd rather not,' he returned, flushing a little. I'm too much in your debt already. Awfully good of you all the same. You go on, you fellows, and I'll watch the play. Let me persuade you, Viscount Linton, said Lucio, looking at him with his dazzling, inscrutable smile. Just for the fun of the thing. If you do not feel justified in staking money, stake something trifling and merely nominal, for the sake of seeing whether the luck will turn. And here he took up a counter. This frequently represents fifty pounds. Let it represent for once something that is not valuable like money. Your soul, for example. A burst of laughter broke from all the men. Lucio laughed softly with them. We all have, I hope, enough instruction in modern science to be aware that there is no such thing as a soul in existence, he continued. Therefore, in proposing it as a stake for this game at Baccarat, I really propose less than one hair of your head because the hair is a something, and the soul is a nothing. Come, will you risk that non-existent quantity for the chance of winning a thousand pounds? The Viscount drained off the last drop of brandy, and turned upon us, his eyes flushing mingled derision and defiance. 
Done! he exclaimed, whereupon the party sat down. The game was brief, and in its rapid excitement almost breathless. Six or seven minutes sufficed, and Lucio rose, the winner. He smiled as he pointed to the counter which had represented Viscount Linton's last stake. "'I have won,' he said quietly. "'But you owe me nothing, my dear Viscount, inasmuch as you risked nothing. We played this game simply for fun. If souls had any existence, of course I should claim yours. I wonder what I should do with it, by the way.' He laughed good-humouredly. "'What nonsense, isn't it? And how thankful we ought to be that we live in advanced days like the present, when such silly superstitions are being swept aside by the march of progress and pure reason. Good night. Tempest and I will give you your full revenge to-morrow. The luck is sure to change by then, and you will probably have the victory. Again, good night. He held out his hand. There was a peculiar melting tenderness in his brilliant dark eyes, an impressive kindness in his manner. Something, I could not tell what, held us all for the moment spellbound as if by enchantment, and several of the players at other tables, hearing of the eccentric stake that had been wagered and lost, looked over at us curiously from a distance. Viscount Linton, however, professed himself immensely diverted and shook Lucio's proffered hand heartily. "'You are an awfully good fellow,' he said, speaking a little thickly and hurriedly. "'And I assure you seriously, if I had a soul, I should be very glad to part with it for a thousand pounds at the present moment. The soul wouldn't be an atom of use to me, and the thousand pounds would. But I feel convinced I shall win to-morrow.' "'I am equally sure you will,' returned Lucio affably. "'In the meantime, you will not find my friend here, Geoffrey Tempest, a hard creditor.' He can afford to wait. But in the case of the lost soul? Here he paused, looking straight into the young man's eyes. Of course, I cannot afford to wait. The Viscount smiled vaguely at this pleasantry, and almost immediately afterwards left the club. As soon as the door had closed behind him, several of the gamesters exchanged sententious nods and glances. Ruined, said one of them in a sotto voce. His gambling debts are more than he can ever pay, added another, and I hear he has lost a clear fifty thousand on the turf. These remarks were made indifferently, as though one should talk of the weather. No sympathy was expressed, no pity wasted. Every gambler there was selfish to the core, and as I studied their hardened faces, a thrill of honest indignation moved me. Indignation mingled with shame. I was not yet altogether callous or cruel-hearted, though as I look back upon those days which now resemble a wild vision rather than a reality, I know that I was becoming more and more of a brutal egoist with every hour I lived. Still, I was so far then from being utterly vile that I inwardly resolved to write to Viscount Linton that very evening and tell him to consider his debt to me cancelled, as I should refuse to claim it. While this thought was passing through my mind, I met Lucio's gaze fixed steadily upon me. He smiled, and presently signed to me to accompany him. In a few minutes we had left the club, and were out in the cold night air under a heaven of frostily sparkling stars. Standing still for a moment, my companion laid his hand on my shoulder. Tempest, if you are going to be kind-hearted or sympathetic to undeserving rascals, I shall have to part company with you, he said, with a curious mixture of satire and seriousness in his voice. I see by the expression of your face that you are meditating some silly, disinterested action of pure generosity. Now you might just as well flop down on these paving stones and begin saying prayers in public. You want to let Linton off his debt. You are a fool for your pains. He is a born scoundrel, and has never seen his way to being anything else. Why should you compassionate him? From the time he first went to college till now, he has been doing nothing but live a life of degraded sensuality. He is a worthless rake, less to be respected than an honest dog. Yet someone loves him, I dare say, I said. Someone loves him, echoed Lucio, with inimitable disdain. Bah! Three ballet girls live on him, if that is what you mean. His mother loved him, but she is dead 
he broke her heart. He is no good, I tell you. Let him pay his debt in full, even to the soul he staked so lightly. If I were the devil now, and had just won the strange game we played tonight, I suppose, according to priestly tradition, I should be piling up the fire for Linton in high glee. But being what I am, I say, let the man alone to make his own destiny. Let things take their course. And as he chose to risk everything, so let him pay everything. We were by this time walking slowly into Pell Mell. I was on the point of making some reply, when catching sight of a man's figure on the opposite side of the way, not far from the Marlborough Club, I uttered an involuntary exclamation. Why, there he is, I said. There is Viscount Linton. Lucio's hand closed tightly on my arm. You don't want to speak to him now, surely? No, but I wonder where he's going. He walks rather unsteadily. Drunk, most probably. And Lucio's face presented the same relentless expression of scorn I had so often seen and marveled at. We paused a moment, watching the Viscount strolling aimlessly up and down in front of the clubs, till all at once he seemed to come to a sudden resolution, and stopped short, he shouted, Handsome! A silent-wheeled smart vehicle came bowling up immediately. Giving some order to the driver, he jumped in. The cab approached swiftly in our direction. Just as it passed us, the loud report of a pistol crashed on the silence. Good God! I cried, reeling back a step or two. He has shot himself! The handsome stopped. The driver sprang down, club porters, waiters, policemen, and no end of people starting up from heaven knows where, were on the scene on an instant. I rushed forward to join the rapidly gathering throng, but before I could do so, Lucio's strong arm was thrown round me, and he dragged me by main force away. "'Keep cool, Geoffrey," he said. "'Do you want to be called up to identify, and betray the club and all its members? Not while I am here to prevent you.' Check your mad impulses, my good fellow. They will lead you into no end of difficulties. If the man's dead, he's dead, and there's an end of it. Lucio, you have no heart, I exclaimed, struggling violently to escape from his hold. How can you stop to reason in such a case? Think of it. I am the cause of all the mischief. It is my cursed luck at Baccarat this evening that has been the final blow to the wretched young fellow's fortunes. I am convinced of it. I shall never forgive myself. "'Upon my word, Geoffrey, your conscience is very tender,' he answered, holding my arm still more closely and hurrying me away despite myself. "'You must try and toughen it a little if you want to be successful in life. Your cursed luck, you think, has caused Linton's death. Surely it is a contradiction in terms to call luck cursed. And, as for the Viscount, he did not need that last game at Baccarat to emphasize his ruin. You are not to blame.' and for the sake of the club if for nothing else i do not intend either you or myself to be mixed up in a case of suicide the coroner's verdict always disposes of these incidents comfortably in two words temporary insanity i shuddered my soul sickened as i thought that within a few yards of us was the bleeding corpse of the man i had so lately seen alive and spoken with and notwithstanding lucio's words i felt as if i had murdered him temporary insanity repeated lucio again as if speaking to himself all remorse despair outraged honour wasted love together with the scientific modern theory of reasonable nothingness life and nothing god and nothing when these drive the distracted human unit to make of himself also a nothing temporary insanity covers up his plunge into the infinite with an untruthful pleasantness However, after all, it is, as Shakespeare says, a mad world. I made no answer. I was too overcome by my own miserable sensations. I walked along almost unconscious of movement, and as I stared bewilderedly up at the stars, they danced before my sight like fireflies whirling in a mist of miasma. Presently a faint hope occurred to me. Perhaps, I said, he has not really killed himself. It may be only an attempt. He was a capital shot, returned Lucio, composedly. That was his one quality. He has no principles, but he was a good marksman. I cannot imagine his missing aim. 
it is horrible an hour ago alive and now i tell you lucio it is horrible what is death it is not half so horrible as life lived wrongly he responded with a gravity that impressed me in spite of my emotion and excitement believe me the mental sickness and confusion of a wilfully degraded existence are worse tortures than are contained in the priestly notions of hell come come geoffrey you take this matter too much to heart you are not to blame if linton has given himself the happy dispatch it is really the best thing he could do he was of no use to anybody and he is well out of it it is positively weak of you to attach importance to such a trifle you are only at the beginning of your career well i hope that career will not lead me into any more such tragedies as the one enacted to-night i said passionately if it does it will be entirely against my will lucio looked at me curiously nothing can happen to you against your will he replied i suppose you wish to imply that i am to blame for introducing you to the club my good fellow you need not have gone there unless you had chosen to do so i did not bind and drag you there you are upset and unnerved come into my room and take a glass of wine you will feel more of a man afterwards we had by this time reached the hotel and i went with him passively with equal passiveness i drank what he gave me and stood glass in hand watching him with a kind of morbid fascination as he threw off his fur-lined overcoat and confronted me his pale handsome face strangely set and stern and his dark eyes glittering like cold steel that last stake of linton's to you i said falteringly his soul which he did not believe in and which you do not believe in returned lucio regarding me fixedly why do you now seem to tremble at a mere sentimental idea if fantastic notions such as god the soul and the devil were real facts there would perhaps be cause for trembling but being only the brain-sick imaginations of superstitious mankind there is nothing in them to awaken the slightest anxiety or fear but you i began you say you believe in the soul i i am brain-sick and he laughed bitterly have you not found that out yet much learning hath driven me mad my friend science has led me into such deep wells of dark discovery that it is no wonder if my senses sometimes reel and i believe at such insane moments in the soul i sighed heavily i think i will go to bed i answered i am tired out and absolutely miserable alas poor millionaire said lucio gently i am sorry i assure you that the evening has ended so disastrously so am i i returned despondently imagine it he went on dreamily regarding me if my beliefs my crack-brained theories were worth anything which they are not i could claim the only positive existing part of our late acquaintance viscount linton but where and how to send in my account with him if i were satan now i forced a faint smile you would have cause to rejoice i said he moved two paces towards me and laid his hands gently on my shoulders no geoffrey and his rich voice had a strange soft music in it no my friend if i were satan i should probably lament for every lost soul would of necessity remind me of my own fall my own despair and set another bar between myself and heaven remember the very devil was an angel once his eyes smiled and yet i could have sworn there were tears in them i wrung his hand hard i felt that notwithstanding his assumed coldness and cynicism the fate of young linton had affected him profoundly my liking for him gained new fervor from this impression and i went to bed more at ease with myself and things in general during the few minutes i spent in undressing i became even able to contemplate the tragedy of the evening with less regret and greater calmness for it was certainly no use worrying over the irrevocable and after all what interest had the viscount's life for me none i began to ridicule myself for my own weakness and disinterested emotion and presently being thoroughly fatigued fell sound asleep 
Towards morning, however, perhaps about four or five o'clock, I woke suddenly as though touched by an invisible hand. I was shivering violently, and my body was bathed in a cold perspiration. In the otherwise dark room there was something strangely luminous, like a cloud of white smoke or fire. I started up, rubbing my eyes, and stared before me for a moment, doubting the evidence of my own senses. For plainly visible and substantially distinct, at a distance of perhaps five paces from my bed, stood three figures, muffled in dark garments and closely hooded. So solemnly inert they were, so heavily did their sable draperies fall about them, that it was impossible to tell whether they were men or women. But what paralyzed me with amazement and terror was the strange light that played around and above them the spectral, wandering, chill radiance that illumined them like the rays of a faint wintry moon. I strove to cry out, but my tongue refused to obey me, and my voice was strangled in my throat. The three remained absolutely motionless, and again I rubbed my eyes, wondering if this were a dream or some hideous optical delusion. Trembling in every limb, I stretched my hand towards the bell, intending to ring violently for assistance, when a voice, low and thrilling with intense anguish, caused me to shrink back appalled, and my arm fell nerveless at my side. Misery! The word struck the air with a harsh, reproachful clang, and I nearly swooned with the horror of it. For now, one of the figures moved and a face gleamed out from beneath its hooded wrappings, a face white as the whitest marble, and fixed into such an expression of dreadful despair as froze my blood. Then came a deep sigh that was more like a death groan, and again the word, Misery! shuddered upon the silence. Mad with fear, and scarcely knowing what I did, I sprang from the bed, and began desperately to advance upon these fantastic masqueraders, determined to seize them, and demand the meaning of this practical and untimely jest, when suddenly all three lifted their heads and turned their faces on me, such faces, indescribably awful in their pallid agony, and a whisper more ghastly than a shriek, penetrated the very fibres of my consciousness misery with a furious bound i flung myself upon them my hands struck empty space yet there distinct as ever they stood glowering down upon me while my clenched fists beat impotently through and beyond their seemingly corporeal shapes and then all at once i became aware of their eyes eyes that watched me pitilessly steadfastly and disdainfully eyes that like witch-fires seemed to slowly burn terrific meanings into my very flesh and spirit convulsed and almost frantic with the strain on my nerves i abandoned myself to despair this awful sight meant death i thought my last hour has surely come then i saw the lips of one of those dreadful faces move some superhuman instinct in me leapt to life in some strange way I thought I knew, or guessed, the horror of what that next utterance would be, and with all my remaining force I cried out, No! No! Not that eternal doom! Not yet! Fighting the vacant air, I strove to beat back those intangible, weird shapes that loomed above me, withering up my soul with the fixed stare of their angry eyes, and with a choking call for help, I fell, as it were, into a pit of darkness, where I lay mercifully unconscious. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How the ensuing hours between this horrible episode and full morning elapsed I do not know. I was dead to all impressions. I woke at last, or rather, recovered my senses, to see the sunlight pouring pleasantly through the half-drawn curtains at my window, and to find myself in bed in as restful a position as though I had never left it. Was it then merely a vision I had seen? A ghastly sort of nightmare? If so, it was surely the most abhorrent illusion ever evolved from dreamland. It could not be a question of health, 
for I had never felt better in my life. I lay for some time quiescent, thinking over the matter, with my eyes fixed on that part of the room where those three shapes had seemingly stood. But I had lately got into such a habit of cool self-analysis, that by the time my valet brought my early cup of coffee, I had decided that the whole thing was a dreadful fantasy, born of my own imagination, which had no doubt been unduly excited by the affair of Viscount Linton's suicide. I soon learned that there was no room left for doubt as to that unhappy young nobleman's actual death. A brief account of it was in the morning papers, though as the tragedy had occurred so late at night there were no details. A vague hint of money difficulties was thrown out in one journal. But beyond that, and the statement that the body had been conveyed to the mortuary there to await an inquest, there was nothing said, either personal or particular. I found Lucio in the smoking room, and it was he who first silently pointed out to me the short paragraph headed, Suicide of a Viscount. I told you he was a good shot, he commented. I nodded. Somehow I had ceased to feel much interest in the subject. My emotion of the previous evening had apparently exhausted all my stock of sympathy, and left me coldly indifferent. Absorbed in myself and my own concerns, I sat down to talk, and was not long before I had given a full and circumstantial account of the spectral illusion which had so unpleasantly troubled me during the night. Lucio listened, smiling oddly. "'That old toquet was evidently too strong for you,' he said, when I had concluded my story. "'Did you give me old toquet?' I responded, laughing. "'Then the mystery is explained. I was already overwrought, and needed no stimulant. But what tricks of the imagination plays us to be sure? You have no idea of the distinct manner in which those three phantoms asserted themselves. The impression was extraordinarily vivid. No doubt. And his dark eyes studied me curiously. Impressions often are very vivid. See what a marvelously real impression this world makes upon us, for example. Ah, but then the world is real, I answered. Is it? You accept it as such, I dare say and things are as they appear to each separate individual. No two human beings think alike. Hence, there may be conflicting opinions as to the reality or non-reality of this present world. But we will not take unnecessary plunges into the infinite question of what is, as contrasted with what appears to be. I have some letters here for your consideration. You have lately spoken of buying a country estate. What say you to Willowsmere Court in Warwickshire? I have had my eye on that place for you. It seems to me just the very thing. It is a magnificent old pile. Part of it dates from Elizabeth's time. It is in excellent repair. The grounds are most picturesque. The classic River Avon winds with rather a broad sweep through the park. And the whole thing, with a great part of the furniture included, is to be sold for a mere song. Fifty thousand pounds cash. I think you had better go in for it. It would just suit your literary and poetic tastes. Was it my fancy, or had his musical voice the faintest touch of a sneer as he uttered the last words? I would not allow myself to think this possible, and answered quickly. Anything you recommend must be worth looking at, and I'll certainly go and see it. The description sounds well, and Shakespeare's country always appeals to me but wouldn't you like to secure it for yourself? He laughed. Not I. I live nowhere for long. I am of a roving disposition, and am never happy tied down to one corner of the earth. But I suggest Willowsmere to you for two reasons. First, that it is charming and perfectly appointed. Secondly, that it will impress Lord Elton considerably if he knows you are going to buy it. How so? Why, because it used to be his property, returned Lucio quietly, till he got it into the hands of the Jews. He gave them Willowsmere as security for loans, and latterly they have stepped in as owners. They've sold most of the pictures, china, bric-a-brac, and other valuables. By the way, have you noticed how the legended God still appears to protect the house of Israel, particularly the base Ursurer? who was allowed to get the unhappy Christian into his clutches nine times out of ten, and no remedy drops from heaven. The Jew always triumphs. Rather inconsistent, isn't it, on the part of an equitable deity? 
his eyes flashed strange scorn anon he resumed as a result of lord elton's unfortunate speculations and the jew's admirable shrewdness willowsmere as i tell you is in the market and fifty thousand pounds will make you the envied owner of a place worth a hundred thousand we dine at the elton's to-night do we not i asked musingly we do you cannot have forgotten that engagement and lady sibyl so soon surely he answered laughing no i have not forgotten i said at last after a little silence and i will buy this willowsmere i will telegraph instructions to my lawyers at once will you give me the name and address of the agents with pleasure my dear boy and lucio handed me a letter containing the particulars concerning the sale of the estate and other items but are you not making up your mind rather suddenly hadn't you better inspect the property first there may be things you object to if it were a rat-infested barrack i said resolutely i would still buy it i shall settle the matter at once i wish to let lord elton know this very night that i am the future owner of willowsmere good and my companion thrust his arm through mine as we left the smoking-room together i like your swiftness of action geoffrey it is admirable i always respect determination even if a man makes up his mind to go to hell i honour him for keeping to his word and going there straight as a die i laughed and we parted in high good humour he to fulfil a club engagement i to telegraph precise instructions to my legal friends messrs bentham and ellis for the immediate purchase in my name at all costs risks or inconveniences of the estate known as willowsmere court in the county of warwick that evening i dressed with more than common care giving my man morris almost as much trouble as if i had been a fidgety woman he waited upon me however with exemplary patience and only when i was quite ready did he venture to utter what had evidently been on his mind for some time excuse me sir he then observed but i dare say you've noticed that there's something unpleasant like about the prince's valet emile well he's rather a down-looking fellow if that's what you mean i replied but i suppose there's no harm in him i don't know about that sir answered morris severely he does a great many strange things i do assure you downstairs with the servants he goes on something surprising sings and acts and dances too as if he were a whole music hall really i exclaimed in surprise i should never have thought it nor should i sir but it's a fact he must be rather an amusing fellow then i continued wondering that my man should take the accomplishments of emile in such an injured manner oh i don't say anything about his amusingness and morris rubbed his nose with a doubtful air it's all very well for him to cut capers and make himself agreeable if he likes but it's the deceit of him that surprises me sir you'd think to look at him that he was a decent sort of dull chap with no ideas beyond his duty but really sir it's quite the contrary if you'll believe me the language he uses when he's up to his games downstairs is something frightful and he actually swears he learnt it from the gentlemen of the turf sir last night he was play-acting and taking off all the fashionable folk then he took to hypnotizing and upon my word it made my blood run cold why what did he do i asked with some curiosity well sir he took one of the scullery maids and sat her in a chair and just pointed at her pointed at her and grinned for all the world like a devil out of a pantomime and though she is generally a respectable sober young woman if she didn't get up with a screech and commence dancing round and round like a lunatic while he kept on pointing and presently she got to jumping and lifting her skirts that high that it was positively scandalous some of us tried to stop her and couldn't she was like mad till all at once number twenty two bell rang that's the prince's room and he just caught hold of her set her down in her chair again and clapped his hands she came to directly and didn't know a bit of what she'd been doing then twenty two bell rang again and the fellow rolled up his eyes like a clergyman and said let us pray and off he went i laughed he seems to have a share of humour at any rate i said i should not have thought it of him but do you think these antics of his are mischievous well that scullery girl is very ill to-day replied morris i expect she'll have to leave she has what she calls the jumps 
and none of us dare tell her how she got them no sir believe me or not as you like there's something very queer about that emile and another thing i want to know is this what does he do with the other servants what does he do with the other servants i repeated bewilderedly what on earth do you mean well sir the prince has a chef of his own hasn't he said morris enumerating on his fingers and two personal attendants beside emile quiet fellows enough who help in the waiting then he has a coachman and a groom that makes six servants altogether now none of these except emile are ever seen in the hotel kitchens the chef sends all the meals in from somewhere in a heated receptacle and the two other fellows are never seen except when waiting at table and they don't live in their own rooms all day though they may sleep there and nobody knows where the carriage and horses are put up or where the coachman and groom lodge certain it is that both they and the chef board out it seems to me very mysterious i began to feel quite unreasonably irritated look here morris i said there's nothing more useless or more harmful than the habit of inquiring into other people's affairs the prince has a right to live as he likes and do as he pleases with his servants i am sure he pays royally for his privileges and whether his cook lives in or out up in the skies or down in a cellar is no matter of mine he has been a great traveller and no doubt has his peculiarities and probably his notions concerning food are very particular and fastidious but i don't want to know anything about his menage if you dislike emile it's easy to avoid him but for goodness sake don't go making mysteries where none exist morris looked up then down and folded one of my coats with special care i saw i had effectually checked his flow of confidence very well sir he observed and said no more i was rather diverted than otherwise at my servant's solemn account of emile's peculiarities as exhibited among his own class and when we were driving to lord elton's that evening i told something of the story to lucio he laughed emile's spirits are often too much for him he said he is a perfect imp of mischief and cannot always control himself why what a wrong estimate i have formed of him i said i thought he had a peculiarly grave and somewhat sullen disposition you know the trite saying appearances are deceptive went on my companion lightly it's extremely true the professed humorist is nearly always a disagreeable and heavy man personally as for emile he is like me in the respect of not being at all what he seems his only fault is a tendency to break the bounds of discipline but otherwise he serves me well and i do not inquire further is morris disgusted or alarmed neither i think i responded laughing he merely presents himself to me as an example of outraged respectability ah then you may be sure that when the scullery maid was dancing he observed her steps with the closest nicety said lucio very respectable men are always particular of inspection into these matters soothe his ruffled feelings my dear geoffrey and tell him that emile is the very soul of virtue i have had him in my service for a long time and can urge nothing against his character as a man he does not pretend to be an angel his tricks of speech and behaviour are the result of a too constant repression of his natural hilarity but he is really an excellent fellow he dabbled in hypnotic science when he was with me in india i have often warned him of the danger there is in practising this force on the uninitiated but a scullery maid heavens there are so many scullery maids one more or less with the jumps will not matter this is lord elton's the carriage stopped before a handsome house situated a little back from park lane we were admitted by a manservant gorgeous in red plush white silk hose and powdered wig who passed us on majestically to his twin brother in height and appearance though perhaps a trifle more disdainful in bearing and he in his turn ushered us upstairs with the air of one who should say see to what ignominious degradation a cruel fate reduces so great a man in the drawing-room we found lord elton standing on the hearth-rug with his back to the fire and directly opposite him in a low armchair reclined an elegantly attired young lady with very small feet i mentioned the feet because as i entered they were the most prominent part of her person being well stretched out from beneath the would-be concealment of sundry flounced petticoats towards the warmth of the fire which the earl rather inconsiderately screened from view 
there was another lady in the room sitting bolt upright with hands neatly folded on her lap and to her we were first of all introduced when lord elton's own effusive greetings were over charlotte allow me my friends prince lucio Rimenez, mr geoffrey tempest gentlemen my sister-in-law miss charlotte fitzroy we bowed the lady gave us a dignified bend of the head she was an imposing-looking spinster with a curious expression on her features which was difficult to construe it was pious and prim but it also suggested the idea that she must have seen something excessively improper once in her life and had never been able to forget it the pursed-up mouth the round pale-coloured eyes and the chronic air of insulted virtue which seemed to pervade her from head to foot all helped to deepen this impression one could not look at miss charlotte long without beginning to wonder irreverently what it was that had in her long past youth so outraged the cleanly proprieties of her nature as to leave such indelible traces on her countenance but i have seen many english women look so especially among the particularly high-bred old and plain-featured of the upper ten very different was the saucy and bright physiognomy of the younger lady to whom we were next presented and who raising herself languidly from her reclining position smiled at us with encouraging familiarity as we made our salutations miss diana chesney said the earl glibly you perhaps know her father prince you must have heard of him at any rate the famous nicodemus chesney one of the great railway kings of course i know him responded lucio warmly who does not i have met him often a charming man gifted with the most remarkable humour and vitality i remember him perfectly we saw a good deal of each other in washington did you though said miss chesney with a somewhat indifferent interest he's a queer sort of man to my thinking rather a cross between the ticket collector and the custom-house officer combined you know i never see him but what i feel i must start on a journey directly railways seem to be written all over him i tell you so i say pa if you didn't carry railway tracks in your face you'd be better looking and you found him humorous did you laughing at the novel and free way in which this young person criticized her parent lucio protested that he did well i don't confessed miss chesney but that may be because i've heard all his stories over and over again and i've read most of them in books besides so they're not much account to me he tells some of them to the prince of wales whenever he can get a chance but he don't try them off on me any more he's a real clever man too he made his pile quicker than most and you're quite right about his vitality my his laugh takes you into the middle of next week her bright eyes flashed merrily as she took a comprehensive survey of our amused faces think i'm irreverent don't you she went on but you know pa's not a stage parent all dressed out in lovely white hair and benedictions he's just an accommodating railway track and he wouldn't like to be reverenced do sit down won't you then turning her pretty head coquettishly toward her host make them sit down lord elton i hate to see men standing the superior sex you know besides you're so tall she added glancing with unconcealed admiration at lucio's handsome face and figure that it's like peering up an apple tree at the moon to look at you lucio laughed heartily and seated himself near her i followed his example the old earl still kept his position legs astraddle on the hearth-rug and beamed benevolence upon us all certainly diana chesney was a captivating creature one of those surface-clever American women who distinctly divert men's minds without in the least rousing their passions. "'So you're the famous Mr. Tempest?' she said, surveying me critically. "'Why, it's simply splendid for you, isn't it? I always say it's no use having a heap of money unless you're young. If you're old, you only want it to fill your doctor's pockets while he tries to mend your poor, tuckered-out constitution.' I once knew an old lady who was left a legacy of a hundred thousand pounds when she was ninety-five. Poor old dear, she cried over it. She just had sense enough to understand what a good time she couldn't have. She lived in bed, and her only luxury was a half-penny bun dipped in milk for her tea. It was all she cared for. 
A hundred thousand pounds would go a long way in buns, I said, smiling. Wouldn't it just? And the fair Diana laughed. "'But I guess you'll want something a little more substantial for your cash, Mr. Tempest. "'A fortune in the prime of life is worth having. "'I suppose you're one of the richest men about just now, aren't you?' "'She put the question in a perfectly naive, frank manner, "'and seemed to be unconscious of any undue inquisitiveness in it. "'I may be one of the richest,' I replied, "'and as I spoke the thought flashed suddenly across me "'how recently I had been one of the poorest.' but my friend here, the prince, is far richer than I. Is that so? And she stared straight at Lucio, who met her gaze with an indulgent, half-satirical smile. Well, now, I guess Pa's no better than a sort of pauper after all. Why, you must have the world at your feet. Pretty much so, replied Lucio composedly. But then, my dear Miss Chesney, the world is so very easily brought to one's feet. Surely you know that and he emphasized the words by an expressive look of his fine eyes. "'I guess you mean compliments,' she replied unconcernedly. "'I don't like them as a rule, but I'll forgive you this once.' "'Do,' said Lucio, with one of his dazzling smiles, that caused her to stop for a moment in her voluble chatter and observe him with mingled fascination and wonderment. "'And you too are young, like Mr. Tempest,' she resumed presently. "'Pardon me,' interrupted Lucio. I am many years older. Really? exclaimed Lord Elton at this juncture. You don't look it, does he, Charlotte? Miss Fitzroy, thus appealed to, raised her elegant tortoise-shell framed glasses to her eyes, and peered critically at us both. I should imagine the prince to be slightly the senior of Mr. Tempest, she remarked in precise high-bred accents, but only very slightly. Anyhow, resumed Miss Chesney, you're young enough to enjoy your wealth, aren't you? Young enough, or old enough, just as you please, said Lucio, with a careless shrug. But as it happens, I do not enjoy it. Miss Chesney's whole aspect now expressed the most lively astonishment. What does money do for you? went on Lucio, his eyes dilating with that strange and wistful expression which had often excited my curiosity. The world is at your feet, perhaps, yes. But what a world! What a trumpery clod of kickable matter! Wealth acts merely as a kind of mirror to show you human nature at its worst. Men skulk and fawn about you, and lie twenty times in as many hours in the hope to propitiate you and serve their own interests. Princes of the blood willingly degrade themselves and their position to borrow cash of you. Your intrinsic merit, if you have any, is thought nothing of. Your full pockets are your credentials with kings, prime ministers, and counsellors. You may talk like a fool, laugh like a hyena, and look like a baboon. But if the chink-chink of your gold be only sufficiently loud, you may soon find yourself dining with the queen if such be your ambition. If, on the contrary, you happen to be truly great, brave, patient, and enduring, with a spark in you of that genius which strengthens life and makes it better worth living, if you have thoughts which take shape in work that shall endure when kingdoms are swept away like dust before the wind, and if, with all this, you are yet poor in current coin, why then, you shall be spurned by all the crowned dummies of the world. You shall be snubbed by the affluent starch-maker and the croesus who lives on the patent pill, the tradesman from whom you buy bedsteads and kitchenware can look down upon you with lordly scorn for does he not by virtue of his wealth alone drive a four in hand and chat on easy and almost patronizing terms with the prince of wales the wealthy denzians of snobland delight in ignoring nature's elected noblemen but supposing said miss chesney quickly you happen to be a nature's nobleman yourself and have the advantage of wealth besides surely you must fairly allow that to be rather a good thing mustn't you lucio laughed a little I will retort upon you in your own words, fair lady, and say, I guess you mean compliments. What I venture to imply, however, is that even when wealth does fall to the lot of one of these nature's noblemen, it is not because of his innate nobility that he wins social distinction. It is simply because he is rich. That is what vexes me. I, for example, have endless friends who are not my friends so much as the friends of my income. They do not trouble to inquire as to my antecedents, 
what i am or where i came from is of no importance neither are they concerned in how i live or what i do whether i am sick or well happy or unhappy is equally with them a matter of indifference if they knew more about me it would perhaps be better in the long run but they do not want to know their aims are simple and unconcealed they wish to make as much out of me and secure as much advantage to themselves by their acquaintance with me as possible and i give them their full way they get all they want and more his musical voice lingered with a curiously melancholy impressiveness on the last word and this time not only miss chesney but we all looked at him as though drawn by some irresistible magnetic spell and for a moment there was silence very few people have any real friends said lord elton presently and in that respect i suppose we're none of us worse off than socrates who used to keep two chairs only in his house one for myself and another for a friend when i find him but you are a universal favourite lucio a most popular fellow and i think you're rather hard on your set people must look after themselves you know eh lucio bowed his head gravely they must indeed he replied especially as the latest news of science is that god has given up the business miss fitzroy looked displeased but the earl laughed uproariously at that moment a step was heard outside approaching the open doorway of the drawing-room and miss chesney's quick ears caught the sound she shook herself out of her reclining attitude instantly and sat erect it's sybil she said with a half laughing half apologetic flash of her brown eyes at us all i never can loll before sybil my heart beat fast as the woman whom poets might have called the goddess of their dreams but whom i was now disposed to consider as an object of beauty lawfully open to my purchase entered clad in simple white unrelieved by any ornament save a golden waist-belt of antique workmanship and a knot of violets nestled among the lace at her bosom she looked far lovelier than when i had first seen her at the theatre there was a deeper light in her eyes and a more roseate flush on her cheeks while her smile as she greeted us was positively dazzling something in her presence her movements her manner sent such a tide of passion through me that for a moment my brain whirled in a dizzy maze and despite the cold calculations i had made in my own mind as to the certainty i had of winning her for my wife there was a wondrous charm of delicate dignity and unapproachableness about her that caused me for the moment to feel ashamed and inclined to doubt even the power of wealth to move this exquisite lily of maidenhood from her sequestered peace ah what fools men are how little do we dream of the canker at the hearts of these women lilies that look so pure and full of grace you are late sybil said her aunt severely am i she responded with languid indifference so sorry papa are you an extemporized fire screen lord elton hastily moved to one side rendered suddenly conscious of his selfish monopoly of the blaze are you not cold miss chesney continued lady sybil in accents of studied courtesy would you not like to come nearer the fire diana chesney had become quite subdued almost timid in fact thank you she murmured and her eyes drooped with what might have been called retiring maiden modesty had not miss chesney's qualities soared far beyond that trite description we heard some shocking news this morning mr tempest said lady sybil looking at lucio rather than at me no doubt you read it in the papers an acquaintance of ours viscount linton shot himself last night i could not repress a slight start lucio gave me a warning glance and took it upon himself to reply yes i read a brief account of the affair terrible indeed i also knew him slightly did you well he was engaged to a friend of mine went on lady sybil i myself think she has had a lucky escape because though he was an agreeable man enough in society he was a great gambler and very extravagant and he would have run through her fortune very quickly but she cannot be brought to see it in that light she is dreadfully upset she had her heart set on being a viscountess i guess said miss chesney demurely with a sly sparkle of her eyes it's not only americans who run after titles since i've been over here 
I've known several real nice girls marry downright mean doughheads just for the sake of being called My Lady or Your Grace. I like a title very well myself, but I also like a man attached to it. The Earl smothered a chuckling laugh. Lady Sybil gazed meditatively into the fire and went on as though she had not heard. Of course, my friend will have other chances. She is young and handsome. But I really think, apart from the social point of view, that she was a little in love with the Viscount. Nonsense, nonsense, said her father somewhat testily. You always have some romantic notion or other in your head, Sybil. One season ought to have cured you of sentiment. Ha, ha, ha. She always knew he was a dissolute rascal, and she was going to marry him with her eyes wide open to the fact. When I read in the papers that he had blown his brains out in a hansom, I said, Bad taste, bad taste. Spoiling a poor cabbie's stock and trade to satisfy a selfish whim? Ha, ha. But I thought it was a good riddance of bad rubbish. He would have made any woman's life utterly miserable. No doubt he would responded Lady Sybil, listlessly. But, all the same, there is such a thing as love sometimes. She raised her beautiful liquid eyes to Lucio's face, but he was not looking her way, and her steadfast gaze met mine instead. What my looks expressed I know not, but I saw the rich blood mantle warmly in her cheeks, and a tremor seemed to pass through her frame. Then she grew very pale. At that moment one of the gorgeous footmen appeared in the doorway. "'Dinner is served, my lord. Good!' And the Earl proceeded to pair us all. "'Prince, will you take Miss Fitzroy? Mr. Tempest, my daughter falls to your escort. I will follow with Miss Chesney.' We set off in this order down the stairs, and as I walked behind Lucio with Lady Sybil on my arm, I could not help smiling at the extreme gravity and earnestness with which he was discussing church matters with Miss Charlotte and the sudden enthusiasm that apparently seized that dignified spinster at some of his remarks on the clergy, which took the form of the most affectionate and respectful eulogies, and were totally the reverse of the ideas he had exchanged with me on the same subject. Some spirit of mischief was evidently moving him to have a solemn joke with the high-bred lady he escorted, and I noted his behavior with a good deal of inward amusement. "'Then you know the dear canon?' I heard Miss Charlotte say, Most intimately, replied Lucio with fervor, and I assure you I am thankful to have the privilege of knowing him, a truly perfect man, almost a saint, if not quite. So pure-minded, sighed the spinster, so free from every taint of hypocrisy, murmured Lucio with intense gravity. Ah, yes, yes, indeed, and so— Here they passed into the dining-room, and I could hear no more. I followed with my beautiful partner, and in another minute we were all seated at table. End of chapter 11The dinner went on in the fashion of most dinners at great houses, commencing with arctic stiffness and formality, thawing slightly toward the middle course, and attaining to just a pleasant warmth of mutual understanding when ices and dessert gave warning of its approaching close. Conversation at first flagged unaccountably, but afterwards brightened under Lucio's influence to a certain gaiety. I did my best to entertain Lady Sybil, but found her like most society beauties somewhat of a vague listener. She was certainly cold, and in a manner irresponsive. Moreover, I soon decided that she was not particularly clever. She had not the art of sustaining or appearing to sustain interest in any one subject. On the contrary, she had, like many of her class, an irritating habit of mentally drifting away from you into an absorbed reverie of her own, in which you had no part and which plainly showed you how little she cared for anything you or anyone else happened to be saying. Many little random remarks of hers, however, implied that in her apparently sweet nature there lurked a vein of cynicism and a certain contempt for men, and more than once her light words stung my sense of self-love almost to resentment. 
while they strengthened the force of my resolve to win her and bend that proud spirit of hers to the meekness befitting the wife of a millionaire and a genius a genius yes god help me that is what i judged myself to be my arrogance was twofold it arose not only from what i imagined to be my quality of brain but also from the knowledge of what my wealth could do i was perfectly positive that i could buy fame buy it as easily as one buys a flower in the market and i was more than positive that i could buy love in order to commence proving the truth of this i threw out a feeler toward my object i believe i said suddenly addressing the earl you used to live in warwickshire at willowsmere court did you not lord elton flushed an apoplectic red and swallowed a gulp of champagne hastily yes uh, yes i um had the place for some time rather a bore to keep up once quite an army of servants just so i replied with a nod of appreciative comprehension i presume it will require a considerable domestic retinue i have arranged to purchase it lady sibyl's frigid composure was at last disturbed she looked strangely agitated and the earl stared till his eyes seemed likely to fall out of his head you you are going to buy willowsmere he ejaculated yes i have wired to my lawyers to settle the matter as quickly as possible and i glanced at lucio whose steel-bright eyes were fixed on the earl with curious intentness i like warwickshire and as i shall entertain a great deal i think the place will suit me perfectly there was a moment's silence miss charlotte fitzroy sighed deeply and the lace bow on her severely parted hair trembled visibly diana chesney looked up with inquisitive eyes and a little wondering smile sybil was born at willowsmere said the earl presently in rather a husky voice a new charm is added to its possession by that knowledge i said gently bowing to lady sybil as i spoke have you any recollections of the place indeed indeed i have she answered with a touch of something like passion vibrating in her accents there is no corner of the world i love so well i used to play on the lawns under the old oak trees and i always gathered the first violets and primroses that came out on the banks of the avon and when the hawthorn was in full flower i used to make believe that the park was fairyland and i the fairy queen as you were and are interposed lucio suddenly she smiled and her eyes flashed then she went on more quietly it was all very foolish but i loved willowsmere and love it still and i often saw in the fields on the other side of the river which did not belong to the estate a little girl about my own age playing all by herself and making long daisy chains and buttercup balls a little girl with long fair curls and a sweet baby face i wanted to know her and speak to her but my nurse would never let me because she was supposed to be beneath me lady sibyl's lip curled scornfully at this recollection yet she was well born she was the orphan child of a very distinguished scholar and gentleman and had been adopted by the physician who attended her mother's deathbed she having no living relatives left to take care of her and she that little fair-haired girl was mavis clare as this name was uttered a sort of hush fell on our party as though an angelus had rung and lucio looking across at me with peculiar intentness asked have you never heard of mavis clare tempest i thought a moment before replying yes i had heard the name connected with literature in some dim and distant way but i could not remember when or how for i never paid any attention to the names of women who chose to associate themselves with the arts as i had the usual masculine notion that all they did whether in painting music or writing must of necessity be trash and unworthy of comment women i loftily considered were created to amuse men not to instruct them mavis clare is a genius lady sybil said presently if mr tempest has not heard of her there is no doubt he will hear i often regret that i never made her acquaintance in those old days at willowsmere the stupidity of my nurse often rankles in my mind beneath me indeed and how very much she is above me now she still lives down there her adopted parents are dead and she rents the lovely little house they inhabited she has bought some extra land about it and improved the place wonderfully indeed i have never seen a more ideal poet's corner than lily cottage i was silent 
feeling somewhat in the background on account of my ignorance as to the gifts and the position of the individual they all seemed to recognize as a celebrity of importance rather an odd name mavis isn't it i at last ventured to observe yes but it suits her wonderfully she sings quite as sweetly as any thrush so she merits her designation what has she done in literature i continued oh only a novel replied lucio with a smile but it has a quality unusual to novels it lives i hope tempest that your forthcoming work will enjoy the same vitality here lord elton who had been more or less brooding darkly over his glass of wine ever since i had mentioned my purchase of willowsmere roused himself from his reverie why god bless my soul he exclaimed you don't mean to tell me that you have written a novel mr tempest was it possible he had never noticed all the prominent advertisements of my book in every paper i thought indignantly what do you want to do that for with your immense position he hankers after fame said lucio half kindly half satirically but you've got fame declared the earl emphatically everybody knows who you are by this time ah my dear lord that is not enough for the aspirations of my gifted friend responded lucio speaking for me his eyes darkening with that mystic shadow of mingled sorrow and scorn which so frequently clouded their lustrous brilliancy he does not particularly care for the immense position that is due to wealth alone because that does not lift him a jot higher than maple of tottenham court road he seeks to soar beyond the furniture man and who shall blame him he would be known for that indescribable quality called genius for high thoughts poetry divine instincts and prophetic probings into the heart of humanity in short for the power of the pen which topples down great kingdoms like card houses and sticks fools caps on the heads of kings generally it is the moneyless man or woman who is endowed with this unpurchasable power this independence of action and indifference to opinion the wealthy seldom do anything but spend or hoard but tempest means to unite for once in his own person the two most strenuously opposed forces in nature genius and cash or in other words god and mammon lady sibyl turned her head towards me there was a look of doubt and wonder on her beautiful face i am afraid she said half smiling that the claims of society will take up too much of your time mr tempest to allow you to continue the writing of books i remember you told me the other evening that you were about to publish a novel i suppose you were originally i mean an author by profession a curious sense of anger burned dully within me originally an author was i not one still was i to be given credit for nothing but my banking book originally why i had never been an actual author till now i had simply been a wandering literary hack a stray super of grub street occasionally engaged to write articles to order on any subject that came uppermost at a starvation rate of pay without any visible prospect of rising from that lowest and dirtiest rung of the literary ladder i felt myself growing red then pale and i saw that lucio was looking at me fixedly i am an author lady sibyl i said at last and i hope i may soon prove my right to be acknowledged as one author is in my opinion a prouder title than king and i do not think any social claims will deter me from following the profession of literature which i look upon as the highest in the world lord elton fidgeted uneasily in his chair but your people he said your family are they literary no members of my family are now living i answered somewhat stiffly my father was john tempest of rexmoor indeed and the earl's face brightened considerably dear me dear me i used to meet him often in the hunting fields years ago you come of a fine old stock sir the tempests of rexmoor are well and honourably known in county chronicles i said nothing feeling a trifle heated in temper though i could not have quite explained why one begins to wonder said lucio then in his soft smooth accents when one is the descendant of a good english county family a distinct cause for pride and moreover has the still more substantial fact of a large fortune to support that high lineage why one should trouble to fight for merely literary honours 
you are far too modest in your ambitions tempest high seated as you are upon banknotes and bullion with all the glory of a fulgent county chronicles behind you you still stoop to clutch the laurel fie my dear fellow you degrade yourself by this desire to join the company of the immortals his satirical tone was not lost upon the company and i who saw that in his own special way he was defending the claims of literature against those of mere place and money felt soothed and grateful the earl looked a trifle annoyed that's all very fine he said but you see it isn't as if mr tempest were driven by necessity to write for his living one may love work for the work's sake without any actual necessity for doing it i interposed for example this mavis clare you speak of is she a woman driven by necessity mavis clare hasn't a penny in the world that she does not earn said lord elton gruffly i suppose that if she did not write she would starve diana chesney laughed i guess she's a long way off starvation just now she remarked her brown eyes twinkling why she's as proud as the proudest drives in the park in her victoria and pear with the best in the land and knows all the swagger people she's nowhere near grub street i should say i hear she's a splendid business woman and more than a match for the publishers all round well i should rather doubt that said the earl with a chuckle it needs the devil himself to match the publishers you are right said lucio in fact i dare say that in the various phases or transmigrations of the spirit into differing forms of earthly matter the devil should he exist at all has frequently become a publisher and a particularly benevolent publisher too by way of diversion we all smiled well i should imagine mavis clare to be a match for anybody or anything said lady sibyl of course she is not rich but she spends her money wisely and to effective advantage i do not know her personally i wish i did but i have read her books which are quite out of the common she is a most independent creature too quite indifferent to opinions i suppose she must be extremely plain then i observed plain women always try to do something more or less startling in order to attract the attention denied to their personality true but that would not apply to miss clare she is pretty and knows how to dress besides such a virtue in literary women exclaimed diana chesney some of them are such dowdies most people of culture went on lady sibyl in our set at any rate are accustomed to look upon miss clare as quite an exception to the usual run of authors she is charming in herself as well as in her books and she goes everywhere she writes with inspiration and always has something so new to say that of course all the critics are down upon her queried lucio oh naturally but we never read reviews nor any one else i should hope said lord elton with a laugh except the fellows who write them ha <laughs> ha i call it damned impertinence excuse the word on the part of a newspaper hack to presume to teach me what i ought to read or what i ought to appreciate i'm quite capable of forming my own judgment on any book that ever was written but i avoid all the confounded new poets avoid em like poison sir ha <laughs> ha anything but a new poet the old ones are good enough for me why sir these reviewers who give themselves such airs with a penn'orth of ink and a pen are mostly half-grown half-educated boys who for a couple of guineas a week undertake to tell the public what they think of such and such a book as if any one cared a jot about their green opinions ridiculous quite ridiculous what do they take the public for i wonder editors of responsible journals ought to know better than to employ such young coxcombs just because they can get them cheap at this juncture the butler came up behind his master's chair and whispered a few words the earl's brow clouded then he addressed his sister-in-law charlotte lady elton sends word that she will come into the drawing-room to-night perhaps you had better go and see that she is made comfortable and as miss charlotte rose he turned to us saying my wife is seldom well enough to see visitors but this evening she feels inclined for a little change and distraction from the monotony of her sick-room it will be very kind of you two gentlemen to entertain her she cannot speak much but her hearing and sight are excellent and she takes great interest in all that is going on 
Dear, dear me, and he heaved a short troubled sigh. She used to be one of the brightest of women. The sweet countess, murmured Miss Chesney with patronizing tenderness. She is quite lovely still. Lady Sybil glanced at her with a sudden haughty frown, which showed me plainly what a rebellious temper the young beauty held in control. And I fell straight away more in love, according to my idea of love, than ever. I confess, I like a woman to have a certain amount of temper. I cannot endure your preternaturally amiable female, who can find nothing in all the length or breadth of the globe to move her to any other expression than a fatuous smile. I love to see the danger flash in bright eyes, the delicate quiver of pride in the lines of a lovely mouth, and the warm flush of indignation on fair cheeks. It all suggests spirit and untamed will, and rouses in a man the love of mastery that is born in his nature, urging him to conquer and subdue that which seems unconquerable. And all the desire of such conquest was strong within me, when, at the close of dinner, I rose and held the door open for the ladies to pass out of the room. As the fair Sibyl went, the violets she wore at her bosom dropped. I picked them up and made my first move. "'May I keep these?' I said in a low tone. Her breath came and went quickly, but she looked straight in my eyes with a smile that perfectly comprehended my hidden meaning. "'You may,' she answered. I bowed, closed the door behind her, and secreting the flowers, returned, well satisfied, to my place at table. End of chapter 12「Left with myself and Lucio, Lord Elton threw off all reserve, and became not only familiar but fawning in his adulation of us both. An abject and pitiable desire to please and propitiate us expressed itself in his every look and word and I firmly believe that if I had coolly and brutally offered to buy his fair daughter by private treaty for a hundred thousand pounds, that sum to be paid down to him on the day of marriage, he would have gladly agreed to sell. Apart, however, from his personal covetousness, I felt and knew that my projected courtship of Lady Sybil would of necessity resolve itself into something more or less of a market bargain unless indeed I could win the girl's love. I meant to try and do this, but I fully realized how difficult, nay, almost impossible it would be for her to forget the fact of my unhampered and vast fortune, and consider me for myself alone. Herein is one of the blessings of poverty which the poor are frequently too apt to forget. A moneyless man, if he wins a woman's love, knows that such love is genuine and untainted by self-interest, but a rich man can never be truly certain of love at all. The advantages of a wealthy match are constantly urged upon all marriageable girls by both their parents and friends, and it would have to be a very unsophisticated feminine nature indeed that could contemplate a husband possessing five millions of money without a touch of purely interested satisfaction. A very wealthy man can never be sure even of friendship, while the highest, strongest, and noblest kind of love is nearly always denied to him in this way carrying out the fulfilment of those strange but true words how hardly shall he that is a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven the heaven of a woman's love tried and proved true through disaster and difficulty of her unflinching faithfulness and devotion in days of toil and bitter anguish of her heroic self-abnegation sweetness and courage through the darkest hours of doubt and disappointment this bright and splendid side of woman's character is reserved by divine ordinance for the poor man. The millionaire can indeed wed whomsoever he pleases among all the beauties of the world. He can deck his wife in gorgeous apparel, load her with jewels, and look upon her in all the radiance of her richly adorned loveliness, as one may look upon a perfect statue or matchless picture. But he can never reach the deeper secrets of her soul or probe the wellsprings of her finer nature. I thought this even thus early in the beginning of my admiration for Lady Sybil Elton, though I did not then dwell upon it, as I have often done since. I was too elated with the pride of wealth to count the possibilities of subtle losses amid so many solid gains, and I enjoyed to the full, and with a somewhat contemptuous malice, 
the humble prostration of a belted earl before the dazzling mine of practically unlimited cash as represented to him in the persons of my brilliant comrade and myself i took a curious sort of pleasure in patronizing him and addressed him with a protecting air of indulgent kindness whereat he seemed gratified inwardly i laughed as i thought how differently matters would have stood supposing i had been indeed no more than author i might have proved to be one of the greatest writers of the age but if with that i had been poor or only moderately well off this same half bankrupt earl who privately boarded an american heiress for two thousand guineas a year would have deemed it a condescension to so much as invite me to his house would have looked down upon me from his titled nothingness and perhaps carelessly alluded to me as a man who writes uh yes uh rather clever i believe and then would have thought no more about me for this very cause as author still though millionaire i took a fantastic pleasure in humiliating his lordship as much as possible and i found the best way to do this was to talk about willowsmere i saw that he winced at the very name of his lost estate and that notwithstanding this he could not avoid showing his anxiety as to my intentions with regard to its occupation lucio whose wisdom and foresight had suggested my becoming the purchaser of the place assisted me in the most adroit fashion to draw him out and to make his character manifest and by the time we had finished our cigars and coffee i knew that the proud earl of elton who could trace his lineage to the earliest days of the crusaders was as ready to bend his back and crawl in the dust for money as the veriest hotel porter expectant of a sovereign tip i had never entertained a high opinion of the aristocracy and on this occasion it was certainly not improved but remembering that the spendthrift nobleman beside me was the father of lady sibyl i treated him on the whole with more respect than his mean and grasping nature deserved on returning to the drawing-room after dinner i was struck by the chill weirdness that seemed to be imparted to it by the addition of lady elton's couch which placed near the fire suggested a black sarcophagus in bulk and outline it was practically a narrow bed on wheels though partially disguised by a silk coverlet draped skilfully so as to somewhat hide its coffin-like shape the extended figure of the paralyzed countess herself presented a death-like rigidity but her face as she turned it towards us on our entrance was undisfigured as yet and distinctly handsome her eyes especially being large clear and almost brilliant her daughter introduced us both in a low tone and she moved her head slightly by way of acknowledgment studying us curiously the while well my dear said lord elton briskly this is an unexpected pleasure it is nearly three months since you honoured us with your company how do you feel better she replied slowly yet distinctly her gaze now fixed with wondering intentness on Prince Rimenez. "'Mother found the room rather cold,' explained Lady Sybil, "'so we brought her as near to the fire as possible. "'It is cold,' and she shivered. "'I fancy it must be freezing hard.' "'Where is Diana?' asked the Earl, "'looking about in search of that lively young lady. "'Miss Chesney has gone to her own room to write a letter,' "'replied his daughter somewhat frigidly she will be back directly at this moment lady elton feebly raised her hand and pointed to lucio who had moved aside to answer some question asked of him by miss charlotte who is that she murmured why mother dear i told you said lady sibyl gently that is prince lucio rimenez papa's great friend the countess's pallid hand still remained lifted as though it were frozen in air what is he the slow voice again inquired and then the hand dropped suddenly like a dead thing now helena you must not excite yourself said her husband bending over her couch with real or assumed anxiety surely you remember all i have told you about the prince and also about this gentleman mr geoffrey tempest she nodded and her eyes turning reluctantly away from rimenez regarded me fixedly you are a very young man to be a millionaire were her next words uttered with evident difficulty are you married i smiled and answered in the negative her looks wandered from me to her daughter's face then back to me again with a singularly intent expression 
finally the potent magnetism of lucio's presence again attracted her and she indicated him by a gesture ask your friend to to come here and speak to me rimenez turned instinctively at her request and with his own peculiar charm and gallant grace of bearing came to the side of the paralyzed lady and taking her hand kissed it your face seems familiar to me she said speaking now as it seemed with greater ease have i ever met you before dear lady you may have done so he replied in dulcet tones and with a most captivating gentleness of manner it occurs to me now i think of it that years ago i saw once as a passing vision of loveliness in the heyday of youth and happiness helena fitzroy before she was countess of elton you must have been a mere boy a child at that time she murmured faintly smiling not so for you are still young madame and i am old you look incredulous alas why is it i wonder i may not look the age i am most of my acquaintances spend a great part of their lives in trying to look the age they are not and i never came across a man of fifty who was not proud to be considered thirty-nine my desires are more laudable yet honourable eld refuses to impress itself upon my features it is quite a sore point with me i assure you well how old are you really asked lady sibyl smiling at him ha ah, i dare not tell you he answered returning the smile but i ought to explain that in my countings i judge age by the workings of thought and feeling more than by the passing of years thus it should not surprise you to hear that i feel myself old old as the world but there are scientists who say that the world is young i observed and that it is only now beginning to feel its forces and put forth its vigour such optimistic wiseacres are wrong he answered the world is a veritable husk of a planet humanity has nearly completed all its allotted phases and the end is near the end echoed lady sibyl do you believe the world will ever come to an end i do most certainly or to be more correct it will not actually perish but will simply change and the change will not agree with the constitution of its present inhabitants they will call the transformation the day of judgment i should imagine it would be a fine sight the countess gazed at him wonderingly lady sibyl seemed amused i would rather not witness it said lord elton gruffly oh why and rimenez looked about with quite a cheerful air a final glimpse of the planet ere we ascend or descend to our future homes elsewhere would be something to remember madame here he addressed lady elton are you fond of music the invalid smiled gratefully and bent her head in acquiescence miss chesney had just entered the room and heard the question do you play she exclaimed vivaciously touching him on the arm with her fan he bowed i do in an erratic sort of fashion i also sing music has always been one of my passions when i was very young ages ago i used to imagine i could hear the angel israfel chanting his strophes amid the golden glow of heavenly glory himself white-winged and wonderful with a voice out ringing beyond the verge of paradise as he spoke a sudden silence fell upon us all something in his accent touched my heart to a strange sense of sorrow and yearning and the countess of elton's dark eyes languid with long suffering grew soft as though with repressed tears sometimes he continued more lightly just at odd moments i like to believe in paradise it is a relief even to a hardened sinner like myself to fancy that there may exist something in the way of a world better than this one surely sir said miss charlotte fitzroy severely you believe in heaven he looked at her and smiled slightly madame forgive me i do not believe in the clerical heaven i know you will be angry with me for this frank confession but i cannot picture the angels in white smocks with goose wings or the deity as a somewhat excitable personage with a beard personally i should decline to go to any heaven which was only a city with golden streets and i should object to a sea of glass 
resenting it as a want of invention on the part of the creative intelligence. But do not frown, dear Miss Fitzroy. I do believe in heaven all the same, a different kind of heaven. I often see it in my dreams. He paused, and again we were all silent, gazing at him. Lady Sibyl's eyes, indeed, rested upon him with such absorbed interest that I became somewhat irritated, and was glad, when turning toward the Countess once more, he said quietly, "'Shall I give you some music now, madame?' She murmured assent, and followed him with a vaguely uneasy glance, as he crossed over to the grand piano and sat down. I had never heard him either play or sing. In fact, so far as his accomplishments went, I knew nothing of him as yet except that he was a perfect master of the art of horsemanship. With the first few bars he struck I half started from my chair in amazement. Could a mere pianoforte produce such sounds? Or was there some witchery hidden in the commonplace instrument, unguessed by any other performer? I stared around me, bewildered. I saw Miss Charlotte drop her knitting abstractedly. Diana Chesney, lying lazily back in one corner of the sofa, half closed her eyelids in a dreamy ecstasy. Lord Elton stood near the fire, resting one arm on the mantelpiece and shading his fuzzy brows with his hand. And Lady Sybil sat beside her mother, her lovely face pale with emotion, while on the worn features of the invalided lady there was an expression of mingled pain and pleasure difficult to describe. The music swelled into passionate cadence. Melodies crossed and recrossed each other like rays of light glittering among green leaves. Voices of birds and streams and tossing waterfalls chimed in with songs of love and playful merriment. Anon came wilder strains of grief and angry clamor. Cries of despair were heard echoing through the thunderous noise of some relentless storm. Farewells everlastingly shrieked amid sobs of reluctant, shuddering agony. And then... As I listened, before my eyes a black mist gathered slowly, and I thought I saw great rocks bursting asunder into flame, and drifting islands in a sea of fire. Faces, wonderful, hideous, beautiful, peered at me out of a darkness denser than night, and in the midst of this there came a tune, complete in sweetness and suggestion, a piercing sword-like tune that plunged into my very heart and rankled there. My breath failed me. My senses swam. I felt that I must move, speak, cry out, and implore that this music, this horribly insidious music, should cease, ere I swooned with the voluptuous poison of it. When, with a full chord of splendid harmony that rolled out upon the air like a breaking wave, the intoxicating sounds ebbed away into silence. No one spoke. Our hearts were yet beating too wildly with the pulsations roused by that wondrous lyric storm. Diana Chesney was the first to break the spell. "'Well, that beats everything I've ever heard,' she murmured tremulously. I could say nothing. I was too occupied with my own thoughts. Something in the music had instilled itself into my blood, or so I fancied, and the clinging, subtle sweetness of it moved me to strange emotions that were neither wise nor worthy of a man. I looked at Lady Sybil. She was very pale. Her eyes were cast down, and her hands were trembling. On a sudden impulse I rose and went to Rimenez, where he still sat at the piano, his hands dumbly wandering over the keys. "'You are a great master,' I said, "'a wonderful performer. But do you know what your music suggests?' He met my fixed gaze, shrugged his shoulders, and shook his head. Crime, I whispered. You have roused in me evil thoughts of which I am ashamed. I did not think that was possible to so divine an art. He smiled, and his eyes glittered with that steely brightness of stars on a wintry night. Art takes its colors from the mind, my dear friend, he said. If you discover evil suggestions in my music, the evil, I fear, must be in your own nature. Or in yours, I said quickly. Or in mine, he agreed coldly. I have often told you I am no saint. I stood hesitatingly looking at him. For one moment his great personal beauty appeared hateful to me, though I knew not why. Then the feeling of distrust and repulsion slowly passed, leaving me humiliated and abashed. Pardon me, Lucio, I murmured regretfully. I spoke in haste, but truly your music almost put me in a state of frenzy. I never heard anything in the least like it. 
"'Nor I,' said Lady Sibyl, who just then moved toward the piano. "'It was marvellous. Do you know, it quite frightened me.' "'I am sorry,' he answered with a penitent air. "'I know I am quite a failure as a pianist. I am not sufficiently restrained, as the pressmen would say.' "'A failure? Good God!' exclaimed Lord Elton at this juncture. "'Why, if you played like that in public, you'd drive everyone frantic!' "'With alarm?' queried Lucio, laughing. "'Or with disgust.' "'Nonsense! You know what I mean very well. I have always had a contempt for the piano as an instrument, but, by Jove, I never heard such music as yours, even in a full orchestra. It is extraordinary. It is positively magnificent. Where in the world did you study?' "'In nature's conservatoire,' replied Rimenez lazily. "'My first maestro was an amiable nightingale. He, singing on a branch of fir when the moon was full, explained with liquid-noted patience how to construct and produce a pure roulade, cadenza, and trill. And when I had learned thus far, he showed me all the most elaborate methods of applying rhythmic tune to the upward and downward rush of the wind, thus supplying me with perfect counterpoint. Chords I learned from old Neptune, who was good enough to toss a few of his largest billows to the shore for my benefit. He nearly deafened me with his instructions, being somewhat excitable and loud-voiced. But on finding me an apt pupil, he drew back his waves to himself with so much delicacy among the pebbles and sand, that at once I mastered the secret of playing arpeggi. Once, too, I had a finishing lesson from a dream. A mystic thing with wild hair and wings, it sang one word in my ears, and the word was unpronounceable in mortal speech but after many efforts I discovered it lurking in the scale of sound. The best part of it all was that my instructors asked no fees. "'I think you are a poet as well as a musician,' said Lady Sibyl. "'A poet? Spare me, my dear young lady. Why are you so cruel as to load me with so vile an imputation? Better be a murderer than a poet. One is treated with much more respect and courteous consideration, by the press at any rate.' The murderer's breakfast menu will be given due place in many of the most estimable journals, but the poet's lack of both breakfast and dinner will be deemed his fitting reward. Call me a livestock producer, a horse breeder, a timber merchant, anything but poet. Why, even Tennyson became an amateur milkman to somewhat conceal and excuse the shame and degradation of writing verse. We all laughed. Well, you must admit, said Lord Elton, that we've had rather too much of poets lately. It's no wonder we're sick of them, and that poetry has fallen into disrepute. Poets are such a quarrelsome lot, too. Effeminate, puling, unmanly humbugs. You are speaking of the newly discovered ones, of course, said Lucio. Yes, they are a weedy collection. I have sometimes thought that out of pure philanthropy I would start a bonbon manufactory and employ them to write mottoes for the crackers. It would keep them out of mischief and provide them with a little pocket money, for as matters stand, they do not make a farthing by their books. But I do not call them poets at all. They are mere rhymers. One or two real poets do exist, but like the prophets of scripture, they are not in society, nor can they get their logs rolled by any of their contemporaries. They are not favorites with any set. That is why I am afraid my dear Tempest will never be accepted as the genius he is. Society will be too fond of him to let him go down into dust and ashes to gather the laurel. It is not necessary to go down into dust and ashes for that, I said. I assure you it is, he answered gaily, positively imperative. The laurel flourishes best so. It will not grow in a hothouse. At that moment Diana Chesney approached. Lady Elton would like to hear you sing, Prince, she said. Will you give us that pleasure? Do something quite simple, you know. It will set our nerves straight after your terribly beautiful music. You'd hardly believe it, perhaps, but I really feel quite unstrung. He folded his hands with a droll air of penitence. Forgive me, he said. I'm always, as the church service says, doing those things I ought not to do. Miss Chesney laughed a trifle nervously. Oh, I forgive you, she replied, on condition that you sing. I obey. And with that, he turned again to the piano, and playing a strange, wild, minor accompaniment, sang the following stanzas. Sleep, my beloved, sleep. Be patient. We shall keep our secret closely hid, beneath the coffin lid. 
there is no other place in earth or air for such a love as ours or such despair and neither hell nor heaven shall care to win our loathed souls rejoicing in their sin sleep for my hand is sure the cold steel bright and pure strikes through thy heart and mine shedding our blood like wine sin's sweetness is too sweet and if the shame of love must be our curse we hurl the blame back on the gods who gave us love with breath and tortured us from passion into death this strange song sung in the most glorious of baritones full and rich and vibrating with power and sweetness had a visibly thrilling effect upon us all again we were struck dumb with surprise and something like fear and again diana chesney broke the silence you call that simple she said half petulantly quite so love and death are the simplest things in the world replied lucio the ballad is a mere trifle it is entitled the last love song and is supposed to be the utterance of a lover about to kill his mistress and himself such events happen every day you know that by the newspapers they are perfectly commonplace he was interrupted by a sharp clear voice ringing imperatively across the room where did you learn that song End of chapter 13chapter 14 of the sorrows of satan by marie corelli this librivox recording is in the public domain it was the paralyzed countess who spoke she had managed to partly raise herself on her couch and her face expressed positive terror her husband hurried to her side and with a curiously cynical smile on his lips rimenez rose from the piano miss charlotte who had sat rigidly upright and silent for some time hastened to attend upon her sister but lady elton was singularly excited and appeared to have gained a sudden access of unnatural vigour go away i'm not ill she said impatiently i feel better much better than i have done for months the music does me good and addressing her husband she added ask your friend to come and sit here by me i want to talk to him he has a magnificent voice and i know that song he sang i remember reading it in a manuscript album long ago i want to know where he found it rimenez here advanced with his gentle tread and courteous bearing and lord elton gave him a chair beside the invalid you are working miracles on my wife he said i have not seen her so animated for years and leaving the two to talk he crossed over to where lady sibyl myself and miss chesney were all seated in a group chatting more or less unrestrainedly I have just been expressing the hope that you and your daughter will pay me a visit at Willowsmere, Lord Elton, I said. His brows contracted a little, but he forced a smile. We shall be delighted, he mumbled. When do you take possession? As soon as it is all feasible, I replied. I shall wait in town till the next levy is over, as both my friend and myself have arranged to be presented. Oh, ah, yes, uh, yes, that is always advisable and it's not half such a troublesome business as a drawing-room is for the ladies it's soon over and low bodices are not de rigueur ha 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 who is your presenter i named a distinguished personage closely connected with the court and the earl nodded a very good man you could not have a better he said complacently and this book of yours when does it come out next week we must get it we must certainly get it said lord elton assuming interest sybil you must put it down on your library list she assented though as i thought a trifle indifferently on the contrary you must allow me to present it to you i said it will be a pleasure to me which i hope you will not deny you are very kind she answered lifting her beautiful eyes to mine as she spoke but the librarian at moody's is sure to send it he knows i read everything though i confess i never buy any books except those by mavis clare again that woman's name I felt annoyed, but took care not to show my annoyance. I shall be jealous of Mavis Clare, I said playfully. Most men are, she replied quietly. You are indeed an enthusiastic partisan of hers, I exclaimed, somewhat surprised. Yes, I suppose I am. I like to see any member of my sex distinguish herself as nobly as she does. I have no genius of my own, and that is one of the reasons why I honor it so much in other women. 
I was about to make some suitable compliment by way of response to this remark, when we were all violently startled from our seats by a most horrible cry, a gasping scream such as might be wrung from some tortured animal. Aghast at the sound, we stood for a moment inert, staring at Rimenez, who came quickly toward us with an air of grave concern. "'I am afraid,' he said softly, "'that the Countess is not so well. Perhaps you had better go to her.' Another shriek interrupted his words, and transfixed with horror, we saw Lady Elton struggling in the throes of some sudden and terrific convulsion, her hands beating the air as if she were fighting with an unseen enemy. In one second her face underwent such hideous contortions as robbed it of all human semblance, and between the agonized pantings of her difficult breath her half-choked voice could be heard uttering wild cries mercy mercy oh god god tell sibyl pray pray to god pray and with that she fell heavily back speechless and unconscious all was instant confusion lady sibyl rushed to her mother's side with miss charlotte diana chesney hung back trembling and afraid lord elton sprang to the bell and rang it furiously fetch the doctor he cried to the startled servant lady elton has had another shock she must be taken to her room at once can i be of any service i inquired with a side glance at rimenez who stood gravely apart a statuesquely composed figure of silence no no thanks all the same and the earl pressed my hand gratefully she should not have come downstairs it has been too exciting for her sybil don't look at her my dear it will only unnerve you miss chesney pray go to your room charlotte can do all that is possible as he spoke two of the men-servants came in to carry the insensible countess upstairs and as they slowly bore her on her coffin-like couch past me one of them drew the coverlet across her face to conceal it but not so quickly that i could not see the awful change impressed upon it the indelible horror that was stamped on the drawn features horror such as surely never was seen except in a painter's idea of some lost soul in torment the eyes were rolled up and fixed in their sockets like balls of glass, and in them also was frozen the same frenzied, desperate look of fear. It was a dreadful face, so dreadful in its ghastly immovableness that I was all at once reminded of my hideous vision of the previous night, and the pallid countenances of the three phantoms that had scared me in my sleep. Lady Elton's looks now resembled theirs. Sickened and appalled, I averted my eyes and was glad to see Rimenez taking farewell of his host, the while he expressed his regret and sympathy with him in his domestic affliction. I myself, approaching Lady Sibyl, pressed her cold and trembling hand in mine, and respectfully kissed it. I am deeply sorry, I murmured. I wish I could do anything to console you. She looked at me with dry, calm eyes. Thank you, but the doctors have always said that my mother would have another shock, depriving her of speech. It is very sad. She will probably live for some years like that. I again expressed my sympathy. May I come and inquire about you all tomorrow? I asked. It will be very kind of you, she answered quietly. Shall I see you if I come? I said in a lower tone. If you wish it, certainly. Our eyes met, and I knew by instinct that she read my thoughts. I pressed her hand again and was not repulsed. Then bowing profoundly, I left her to make my adieu to Lord Elton and Miss Chesney, who seemed terribly upset and frightened. Miss Charlotte Fitzroy had left the room in attendance on her sister, and she did not return to bid us good night. Rimenez lingered a moment behind me to say another word or two to the Earl, and when he joined me in the hall and threw on his opera coat, he was smiling to himself somewhat singularly. An unpleasant end for Helena, Countess of Elton he said, when we were in our brougham, driving away. Paralysis is perhaps the worst of all the physical punishments that can befall a rapid lady. Was she rapid? Well, perhaps rapid is too mild a term. But I can find no other, he answered. When she was young, she is barely fifty now. She did everything that could be done by woman at her worst and wildest. She had scores of lovers, and I believe one of them cleared off her husband's turf debts the earl consenting gladly, on a rather pressing occasion. "'What disgraceful conduct!' I exclaimed. He looked at me with an expression of cynical amusement. "'Think so? The upper ten quite condone that sort of thing in their own set nowadays. It is all right. 
if a lady has lovers and her husband beams benevolence on the situation what can be said nothing how very tender your conscience is geoffrey i sat silent thinking my companion lit a cigarette and offered me one i took it mechanically without lighting it i made a mistake this evening he went on i should not have sung that last love song the fact is the words were written by one of her ladyship's former admirers a man who was something of a poet in his way and she had an idea that she was the only person living who had ever seen the lines she wanted to know if i knew the man who composed them and i was able to say that i did very intimately i was just explaining how it was and why i knew him so well when the distressing attack of convulsions came on and finished our conversation she looked horrible i said the paralyzed helen of a modern troy yes her countenance at the last was certainly not attractive beauty combined with wantonness frequently ends in the drawn twitch fixed eye and helpless limbs of life in death it is nature's revenge on the outraged body and do you know eternity's revenge on the impure soul is extremely similar what do you know about it i said smiling in spite of myself as i looked at his fine face expressive of perfect health and splendid intellectuality your absurd fancies about the soul are the only traces of folly i discover in you really well i am glad i have something of the fool in my disposition foolishness being the only quality that makes wisdom possible i confess i have odd very odd notions about the soul i will excuse them i said laughing god forgive me in my own insensate blind conceit the while he regarded me fixedly in fact i will excuse anything for the sake of your voice i do not flatter you lucio you sing like an angel don't use impossible comparisons he replied have you ever heard an angel sing yes i answered smiling i have this very night he turned deathly pale a very open compliment he said forcing a laugh and with almost rough haste he suddenly let down the window of the carriage though the night was bitter cold this vehicle is suffocating me let us have some air see how the stars are shining like great crown jewels deities regalia hard frost like hard times brings noble work into prominence yonder far off is a star you can hardly perceive red as a cinder at times and again blue as the lightning i can always discover it though many cannot it is algol judged by superstitious folk to be an evil star i love it chiefly on account of its bad reputation it is no doubt much maligned it may be a cold quarter of hell where weeping spirits sit frozen in ice made of their own congealed tears or it may be a preparatory school for heaven who knows yonder too shines venus your star geoffrey for you are in love my friend come confess it are you not i am not sure i answered slowly the phrase in love scarcely describes my present feeling you have dropped these he said suddenly picking up a fast fading knot of violets from the floor of the brougham and holding them towards me he smiled as i uttered an exclamation of annoyance they were lady sibyl's flowers which i had inadvertently let fall and i saw he knew it i took them from his hand in silence my dear fellow do not try to hide your intentions from your best friend he said seriously and kindly you wish to marry the earl of elton's beautiful daughter and you shall trust me i will do everything i can to promote your desire you will i exclaimed with unconcealed delight for i fully recognized the influence he had over sibyl's father i will i promise he answered gravely i assure you that such a marriage would be one after my own heart i'll do all i can for you and i have made many matches in my time my heart beat high with triumph, and when we parted that night I wrung his hand fervently and told him I was devoutly grateful to the fates for sending me such a good friend as he was. Grateful to whom did you say? he asked with a whimsical look. To the fates! Are you really? They are very ugly sisters, I believe. Perhaps they were your ghostly visitors of last night. God forbid! I ejaculated. Ah, God never forbids the fulfillment of his own laws, he answered to do so he would have to destroy himself if he exists at all i said carelessly true if and with this we separated to our different quarters in the grand end of chapter fourteen